Welcome, everybody, to Full Momentum in HEC RAS Vodcast. Uh, I am your host, Ben Carey, and here joining me, as always, is Chris Goodell. Chris, welcome to episode 15 of Full Momentum. It has been a minute since we got together and talked about HEC RAS on this forum. How you been? I've been good. Yeah, it's been a long minute. Um, we've uh, been really busy, huh? Um, yeah. We've been trying to do this vodcast for several weeks now and it seems like something always jumps in the way you know project work or meetings or whatever and so finally we got some time to talk a little heck raz today so uh no things have been good it's um the weather's starting to get better here seeing more sunny days that's always a good thing um kind of a in a lull sports wise we got some uh college baseball going on which i've been following it's been uh, a little frustrating at times with my beavers but I want to ask you about the NCAA tournament because man, was that a roller coaster ride? And not surprising, Gonzaga was there at the very end. What was surprising though was my Beavers got to the Elite Eight, and I was thinking, man, wouldn't this be an awesome podcast for Ben and I to talk <laughs> about how Oregon State beat Gonzaga in the finals? I don't know if it would have worked out that way, but you know what I mean. It, um, it, would, it would have quickly transitioned into a college basketball <laughs> podcast. Uh, we yes. Would have, we would have ditched HTC Raz for the day, but alas, the Beavers bowed out in the Elite Eight after a, a amazing, beyond improbable uh, run. Um, yeah, it was obviously. very surprising. Each each game, I thought, there's no way we're going to win this. And then it's like, oh my gosh, we won this game. Now we're into the next level. And we got to Houston, and Houston just just had our number. I mean, there was, there was nothing to do against Houston. They were really good. Um, but I want to, I want to ask you about Gonzaga. I mean, I think one of the best games I've ever seen in my entire life was that UCLA Gonzaga game semifinals. That was incredible. And that must've just been for me as a fan, I was just wired to, I can only imagine what it was like for, a Gonzaga fan watching that game. Yeah, <laughs> it was a, for that matter. It was a special night for sure. Um, obviously, with what happened on Monday, uh, uh, as a Gonzaga fan, a lot of that you lose a lot of the perspective on how cool that game was. But I'm sure over time we'll regain that. But uh, a lot of us are still in mourning from uh, yeah. what happened against against Baylor in the national championship. But um, like you said, that that game was incredible. It was a great NCAA tournament overall. Um, I know for everybody who likes college basketball in the U.S. and you know abroad, uh, it was it was just really awesome having the NCAA tournament back after missing it last year. Um, hopefully, man alive. Hopefully, we never ever ever have to uh, miss another NCAA tournament again for for health reasons. So, um, yeah, it was it was very cool. Exactly. So, um, how are the Bulldogs going to look for next year? Uh, they're gonna be, run, you think? Yeah, they're going to be really good again. Uh, you know, I think they're pretty consensusly looked at as another, you know, preseason top five team. And any time that you're rated that high, you're going to have a chance. So, um, but right. you know, as we learned with the Beavers and Gonzaga, in a single limited <laughs> in a single elimination tournament, anything can <laughs> anything happen. Can so. happen. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, cool. Well, hey, uh, this vodcast. Uh, let's get back to heck Raz talk because that's what this is all about. <laughs> but uh, Ben and I thought, hey, why don't we uh, we do a little dam breach talk today? Um, it's one of the things I really enjoy doing. Uh, I've been doing dam breach modeling for, uh, I mean, almost 20 years now in heck Raz, and things have evolved quite a bit, not just in heck Raz, but in general, the, the dam breach uh, process that people do. And um, there have been dam breaches all throughout history, um, dating to the time when dams were first made, first built, right? Mm -hmm. But even in the U.S., we've had some uh, some dam failures of note. And uh, Ben, you did a little research on one of those, and yeah. I'd like to hear about it. Let's let's see what you got. Yeah, that's a good transition there, Chris. Like Chris said, dam breach modeling is is really interesting. It's challenging. Um, in Chris and I's 1D and 2D HEC RAS class, we talk a lot about how even if you don't do dam breach analysis in your consulting career, knowing how to do dam breach analysis is a real valuable tool because if you can if you can set up and execute a, a, 
a dam breach model, you can do just about any type of modeling because of how dynamic, um, quick changing uh, a dam breach model is. And you know, one of the things that Chris always likes to, to emphasize is RAS doesn't like sudden changes, right? So as a modeler, you want to avoid those sudden quick changes. Uh, if you can, yeah. uh, those are likely to lead, lead to instabilities. And you cannot have anything um, that changes quicker than when you have a dam breach analysis. So that's true. I mean, we we know by now that um, a lot or most of the instabilities in unsteady flow modeling come out of those acceleration terms, right? And yeah. if you think about a dam break, what accelerates more than a dam break flood wave, right? I mean, you've got both local acceleration, you've got convective acceleration with change in geometry. And a lot of times these dams are built on steep slopes, you know, in canyonized areas. Those are good places to put dams. And you throw all that into a HECRAS model and it's tough. It can be really tough to stabilize. But fortunately, there's lots of tricks. And um, once Ben's done with his uh, demonstration here, I'm going to provide a little bit of information on how do you go about stabilizing your model? What are some tricks you can use? How do you set it up for, uh, you know, your best chance of success? And, and then I'll go through and talk a little bit about the actual window, the dam breach editor in HECRAS and what everything means and, you know, what are the numbers for that? Great. Yeah, so along with some of the technical conversations around dam breach analysis that we're going to have today, um, as many of you who follow the podcast know, we traditionally like to at least try to touch on um, a historic hydraulic event and kind of frame that in terms of HEC RAS and hydraulic modeling. And so as we were kind of going to get into some dam breach analysis discussion today, I wanted to look back at uh, a historic event that had happened in the U.S. regarding dam breach analysis. And as Chris mentioned, there's been a lot of, of, of breach dam events uh, in the U.S. history. Obviously, there were a lot more um, in, in its early days as a country because there weren't the regulations and the quality engineering that we have today. Um, and the event that I stumbled upon that I thought would be interesting to explore today is the Johnstown Dam Failure, which is in uh, eastern or western Pennsylvania, uh, just a little ways outside of Pittsburgh. And so I'm going to share my screen here so you guys can see um, kind of the area where the Johnstown Dam Failure occurred. So if I zoom out a little bit, you can see that we're just uh, east of Pittsburgh here, uh, right up upstream of the town of Johnstown. And the Johnstown Dam was actually constructed on the uh, Kunama River. I'm kind of um, guessing on that a little bit. Um, <laughs> and uh, the Kunama River uh, flows from a east or west direction down into the town of Johnstown here. And the dam was constructed upstream at this location here where there's an existing uh, flood national memorial because of, of the dam breach that occurred uh, in 1889. Um, I believe it was in May. Uh, let me verify that really quick. Um, yeah, May of 1889, there was a large uh, rainfall event that occurred over um, really the entire state of Pennsylvania. It caused flooding in many, many rivers, including the, the Kudama. And the flood from that uh, rain event caused water to back up behind the Johnstown Dam, eventually overtop the dam and uh, cause a failure. Uh, the Johnstown Dam was an earthen embankment dam with a concrete sp emergency spillway, and uh, basically the entire dam uh, failed, causing a massive flood wave to move downstream uh, just in a few minutes. Uh, this is a pretty short river reach here into the town of Johnstown, which was a, a pretty happening town at the time. And there were over 2,200 people that were killed from this. So it's one of the deadliest dam breaches uh, in American history. So it's a, a pretty significant event. And as I started reading more into it <laughs> and looking at the surrounding area, I realized that this would be a really good one to analyze in, in HEC RAS and maybe explore some of the new 6.0 features that are available to us. Um, so this is kind of setting the stage. What I did is I set up a new HEC RAS project in RAS Mapper, um, in the new 6.0 RAS Mapper. And so I'm going to pull that up here and show you guys what it looks like. Um, so again, I'm zoomed in here to the area where the dam uh, existed at the time uh, of the failure. And if we zoom in, uh, you can actually see, as, as this takes a, a little bit to, to refresh here, you can actually see the old uh, wing walls from the dam. So you can see 
uh, the dam extended out to about here on, on the right overbank. And then on here you can see a, the elevated wing wall on the left here. Uh, this is even more obvious if we turn off Google Satellite and look at the terrain. You can see how LIDAR of this area actually picks up um, what's mm -hmm. left of that dam structure here. Um, this this high this is a highway downstream of it that obviously wasn't constructed at the time of the dam failure in 1889. And so uh, what I wanted to do is I wanted to explore a couple different things. I wanted to look at um, terrain modifications because that's a new really exciting feature in 6.0. I wanted to look at rain on grid because that's something that more and more people are going to start using now that there's infiltration and some other capabilities that really enhance uh, the rain on grid functionality of HEC RAS. Um, and then I wanted to use the 3D viewer to analyze what a dam breach analysis looks like if we're using that 3D viewer. So I, I went through each one of those items. So the first thing I did is I wanted to add back in the historic uh, Johnstown Dam uh, via terrain modifications. <clears throat> and so uh, for those of you who uh, are not aware, one of the updates uh, with RAS 6.0 is you now have the ability to manipulate your underlying terrain with polygons and you can change uh, individual elevations within the terrain. You can add uh, levees or river channels. You can add high ground points. You can add piers. All of this by adding polygons or polylines to your terrain and then adding some information to those um, modifications in order to, to actually modify your terrain. So what you do is you, um, if you're wanting to make some modifications, you simply right click on the terrain file that you're using. So in this case, um, it's called terrain. And you're going to clone this terrain and that's important because the modifications that you make um, are going to be to your clone terrain not the underlying terrain in and of itself so your original terrain uh, stays uh, unmodified so if we right click here and we're going to add a name so i'm going to call this modified and then as that's that should just take a few minutes to generate here when that comes up we'll have the ability to add what are called um, modification layers. So if we right click on that uh, cloned terrain under modification layers, you can see we have a number of different options here. So we can add shapes. Um, so this would be a polygon, circle, rectangle, triangle. Each shape is going to have a specified elevation associated with it. So this is a great application for a pier, for instance, if you want to add a pier to your terrain. Now, a natural question that comes out of this is, well, why would you want to add a pier to the terrain? You can just add that into uh, an inline structure like a bridge or whatnot. But if you're doing 2D modeling, um, the current way that the bridge routines are set up uh, in HEC RAS, although they take into account the losses that are added to that bridge opening because of the pier, um, it's not going to actually show you what the near field flow patterns are around that pier because it's only going to uh, take into account what's in the actual underlying terrain when it comes to how those flow patterns are going to be. Uh, propagated in, in your model and so by adding a pier using terrain modifications you'll have the ability to actually see how flow is moving around piers through a bridge opening for instance okay. in this case what i wanted to do is i wanted to add a line though and i wanted to add a line um, that represents high ground so i'm going to have to go ahead and click that go ahead and just call it high ground you can see you add this as a new feature just like you would a cross section or anything else in ras mapper my high ground is selected. I click add new feature. And what I want to do is I want to draw this line as close to the crest of the old dam as I can. So I'm going to start here on the uh, left wing wall over to the right wing wall. And double click that line will finish up and then you're going to get something that pops up here and you can have a, you have a bunch of different options to modify this terrain. And if you haven't um, worked with the terrain modification layer, Go back and watch some of our previous previous podcasts. We do a great job of covering this in depth. Um, but what I'm going to what I'm going to do here is you can see that as a default, what RAS wants to do is it wants to take the elevation on the left uh, and interpolate it over to the elevation on the right and create a, a new polygon that represents that. And in this case, that's exactly what we want to do because we're basically just replacing that original crest elevation, which is should be the same and it is on the left and right overbanks. And so I'm just going to go ahead and press OK. And what we're going to hey, see what about the what about the side slopes then are you getting to that yeah i mean so again but, side slopes are one of those modification tools that you can you can modify in this case uh, i believe when i created this modification layer um 
it did a pretty good job of representing it just as the default side slope, so I didn't have to modify it. But that's okay. something again, one of those one of those many options in that modification tool that, that you have the ability to touch on. So, right, right. Uh, and what I'm gonna do. So let me go ahead and re display this so it's a little bit easier to view. And so you can see now that I've added that uh, high ground line in, it does a really good job of replacing that. In fact, like Chris said, the side slopes seem to match really the dam shape overall and, and very, very well. So I'm happy with that modification there. So if we were, for instance, to set up a 2D model of this area and we were to have make sure our cell faces were aligned to the crest of this dam, we would get water impounded behind this, this dam here. Um, until it would overtop and that was so, kind of the goal of the exercise yeah so ben it, it almost looks in this view like you've created a bridge deck versus a, a dam that fills all the way to the bottom and and i assume that's just kind of a graphical thing it, it actually does extend all the way to the bottom right yeah so um if we again anytime that you want to explore what the elevations in your terrain are uh, you can always select the terrain that you want to explore and then just hover over it and get an idea for what the elevations are here. So you can see that um, if we go to the edge here where Chris has talked about, it looks like there's a bridge deck. We do have a pretty serious drop off. So we go from about 1596 down to 1543. So we do have a 50 foot drop off here on the edge. Um, and so again, that's not a perfect representation of what this dam looked like. There was likely some uh, a more gradual dissension here. But for the exercise that we're looking at today, where we just simply want to replicate that dam breach analysis, uh, this is this is going to be fine. So you have uh, but, you have slopes coming down from the crest down to a point, and then it goes straight down vertical. Correct. Yep. Gotcha. Exactly. Okay. Yep. And I believe and if that's you wanted the, to, if you wanted to extend those slopes, you just go back to the editor and um, change the. How, how would you change that? Yeah. So you come down here um, again. The if we want to go into each one of these, so you can change the top width. Um, which is going to change the the width here that you see in this in this cross section view. You can change the left side slope and the right slide slope, which is going to adjust the slope here, um, and then the maximum extent width, which is going to be the maximum width that you want to to modify um, on either side of of your top width. So, so that's the limiting thing right there. Correct. Yeah. So if I okay. ended this out, made this 200 feet, and we looked at what this looked like, you can see there you go. Yeah. Slope down. Okay. Um, and we could also, if we wanted to see how far this section needs to go to tie into the channel, it's probably going to be pretty far. Um, but let's just go ahead and make this 500 feet and see what that looks like. You can see that at that. There you a go. Little, yeah, a little bit, a little bit better. So. And you might play with the slope a little bit to to line up the um, the elevations because there's a little disjointedness going across there. But um, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So again, you, if you were um, really focused on, on replicating the existing, or at the time the existing structure, um, you could spend you know a good amount of time uh, adjusting this. Uh, let's see. So in this case, we probably want to make it steeper. So. No, that I think that's shallower. Yeah. Try one and a half. Yeah. Thank you. Let's see what this does if we adjust this down. Yeah, it's same. actually fixing it in real time. That actually looks yeah. really good. On the yeah. downstream anyway, maybe the upstream might might need a, a shallower slope. Sure. So yeah, this that Chris, I think that's a good little exercise there, and in, in, you know, not only just adding that terrain, but tying it into the existing terrain. Uh, yeah. A little bit better. So that was a good idea to do that. Again, for a dam breach analysis, and I'll show you guys the extent of this 2D model. Um, for a dam breach analysis, the size of what we're doing, you know, the 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 side slopes on either side of this dam aren't going to make too much of a difference at all to the to the final solution, especially given the fact that um, you know this is going to be represented by an SA 2D area connection um, in which water is going to be passed through this high ground feature based on our dam breach opening, um, not necessarily the side the existing side slopes of the dam here. So yeah, and I know that that you did this just you know as a way to demonstrate the terrain modification, but. In reality, you could set this up even without modifying the terrain, just putting an SA2D area connection across there, but it wouldn't look as fun. It wouldn't look as cool. <laughs> no doubt. Yeah, exactly. And uh, if you wanted to just simply analyze how this dam impounded water over time, you know, this, yeah. this, is, a, this is a good way to do yep. that as well. So that, that's, exactly. a, that's a good highlight of what the terrain modification tool, um, you know, can, can add to a, to a model and to a, an exercise. Next, what I wanted to do is I wanted to set up um, 
the dam breach analysis using a large 2D model. So let me go ahead and open up the geometry of what that looks like. While you're opening that up, the uh, another thing you could do is take out the highway embankments too, kind of using a, instead of filling in, you can actually remove material with this modification. Um, my guess is back in 1897 or whatever it was, that highway probably didn't exist there uh, or certainly not to that size. So you could even take that out to get even more accurate. Yep, yeah, definitely. Yeah, a lot of the LIDAR that's taken in obviously the last 10 years isn't going to reflect what the existing conditions were in 1889. So there's there's an almost unlimited number of modifications you could do if you wanted to. Do <laughs> right. So, yeah. Um, all right, so this is the 2D model that I added for this exercise. So you can see what I've done is I've created two separate 2D areas. I have this downstream Johnstown here and then the upstream Johnstown here. The reason I separated them is one, I wanted to have that SA2D area connection um, that represented the dam uh that connected both of the the 2d areas and in order to in order to have an existing um, water surface elevation upstream of the dam uh, because at the time of the large precipitation event in 1889 there was standing water behind uh the dam there was a reservoir that was what that was present and if we had made this a single 2d area we wouldn't be able to start with an existing water surface elevation in this upstream 2d area um, mm. We would have to fill that up over time. And so in order to start with the water surface elevation that represented what the reservoir may have been, I split this up into two 2D areas. Um, the other reason I did that is I wanted to add precipitation um, to this 2D area and not necessarily this 2D area. Now, in reality, as we know and for this event, there was undoubtedly rainfall that occurred on this downstream 2D area um, preceding the, the dam breach itself. But anytime that you have a rain on grid 2D model, that's going to be a significantly computationally intensive model because every single 2D cell here is going to be receiving water and therefore it is going to be uh, requiring computation time and computation uh, power from your computer. And so in the spirit of expediting this model as, as uh, efficiently as I could, I just simply had one 2D area receiving uh, 2D rain on grid. And then the downstream 2D area, I simply had uh, downstream or upstream boundary conditions that had uh, water coming into the various tributaries here uh, going into the town of Johnstown. So that was the general model setup that I had. Uh, I did spend some time adding some refinement regions to represent the channels you can see. And then we had that SA2D area connection that represented the dam itself. So if we look at uh, a few videos of what the results of this was. Let me go ahead and pull up a few videos um, that kind of capture uh, what this uh, dam breach event looked like. Uh, and if we have more time, I'd love to get into what we used for dam breach parameters and all that stuff, but um, we have some other really good content that we want to share with you guys today. So we're just going to show some of the results from this dam breach analysis. You Both can see the the rain on grid artifacts over there on the bottom right, all the, the fragmentation. That's classic for a rain on grid model. Yep, yep, exactly. And so every single cell, again, in that 2D area is going to be receiving flow uh, via uh, boundary condition of precipitation, and therefore it's going to take some, some computational power to, to run that model. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show results from a traditional RAS mapper output sense. So we're going to look at you know, if we were using RAS 5.07, these are results that we could view um, and then they'd be helpful to understand kind of what happens when the dam is breached, how that impacts the downstream areas. And then I'm going to go into the 3D viewer and show how um, that can really enhance the presentation of results from an HEC RAS model, particularly a dam breach model of this size. Um, so first, let's go ahead and watch this video, which again represents uh, the rain on grid occurring um, in the upstream basin, we have uh, inflow boundary conditions representing these two tributaries. And then the town of Johnstown is right here. And you can see the town of Johnstown obviously is much larger than it was in 1889. But nevertheless, as we see that breach wave moving downstream, uh, keep in mind that when that arrived at, at Johnstown, just the devastation that occurred um, when that happened. So we can see that we, that dam breach begins and starting to move downstream. Uh, and this is it really, I think it took seven, seven to nine minutes to reach Johnstown from when the dam was breached. So not a lot of time uh, for any type of emergency action plans, not that there were any at that, 
that time. Do you have a Do you have a sense of the distance that is from I'd the dam have, to the town? I, yeah, I'd have to hop in the RAS map for a measure. I don't know. What okay. Is. I mean, yeah, it can't be that far for seven to nine minutes. That is, that is a quick arrival time. Yeah. Oh, you can see. Did just, this? Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, go ahead, Chris. Uh, I was going to ask, did did this happen? What time of day was this? Middle of the night during during the no, day? I believe or? it was in the afternoon, like one or two in the afternoon. Okay. Yeah. So there were there were people on site, kind of trying to uh, mitigate against the impending disaster at the dam, but it got to the point where they realized there was nothing they could do, and at that point, it was too late. So mm. here's a, here's another video of again, just kind of a traditional RASMAP output, really of the town of Johnstown itself, and you'll see that breachway moving through and just how devastating that would be uh, if you were living Sheesh. in Johnson. So, yeah, a serious, serious, serious event. So that's the traditional RAS mapper output from this. I also wanted to look at what some of the 3D um, output for this would look like. And so this first video is going to be just a, a stagnant video um, of downstream of the dam. So you can see that in the new 3D viewer, you have the ability to pan around um, and, and pan around the terrain and look at the results from a 3D standpoint. Uh, we, we actually wanted to do this live with you guys, but because of the fact that when you share uh, a 3D video, or I, sh I should say a 3D output um, over a recording, it really slows down the processing um, it would make it unwatchable. So we we decided the best way to do this would be to show videos of kind of what that 3D rendering looks like. If you want some more information on how to move around in the 3D viewer, what that looks like, um, please look at our last uh, podcast episode, episode 14. We had a couple people from uh, HEC actually come on and talk us through what that 3D viewer looks like and how to utilize it. So I highly encourage you to use that video if you want more information on the 3D viewer. Um, so this video again is, is shows basically just downstream of the dam. So we're going to kind of zoom down here. This is the looking at the uh, face of Johnstown Dam from the downstream direction. And you're going to see as that breach occurs, um, the downstream water service elevation increasing pretty drastically. We see a dropping of the downstream water service elevation and those really high velocities um, that are that come with the dam breach analysis. And it's you can see clearly that the model does not actually show a breach in the dam. So in case anybody's wondering about that, it won't modify the terrain during the simulation, but um, it definitely did breach. <laughs> you can <Yep>. tell. <laughs> so that that's a, an example of a somewhat static point of view in which you can um, view 3D output. You can also create what are called flight paths in 3D, where you set a specific path that you'd like the camera to take um, over a period of time. And that can either be if the result, you can have the results being held constant. So at a single time step and you can kind of fly around it to view the results. Or what I've done here is I've created a flight path. So our camera is going to kind of follow a, a specified path at the same time that the dam breach wave is actually moving downstream. So we're going to be kind of chasing uh, the dam breach moving downstream. It's a little, uh, little Indiana Jones ish <laughs> for those of you guys of, of the generation that, that watched Indiana Jones. So, so again, you can see the 3d viewer here. We're starting up a very high elevation. You can see our downstream reach here. The town of Johnstown is down here in this location. And what we're going to do is we're going to zoom down. So we're a little bit closer to the water surface elevation, and then we're going to kind of just follow the dam breach, um, as it moves downstream. So it looks like the elevation is exaggerated a certain amount to kind of make it show better, right? Yeah, for sure. So again, you can see it moving downstream and you're going to notice the dam breach pop here right as we cross over that dam and then we're going to kind of chase that breach wave moving downstream. And again, this is this probably took me 30 minutes to set up. Um, but it's an extremely powerful way to display results um, of any hydraulic model that you have, but particularly a dam breach model. If you have a client or if you have, you know, if this is part of an emergency action plan that you want to develop some some material for those that could be affected to understand the significance of a dam breach, this is a great way to. To do that. So. And we're right over the town of Johnstown. You can see how inundated the area is. 
and then moving downstream into the, the canyon area downstream of, of Johnstown where there isn't quite as much flooding. This is really awesome, Ben. Really cool looking. I, I would uh, I just want to point out too because I've done a little tinkering around with the 3D viewer and just be aware it's it takes a lot of resources to run this 3D viewer on your computer. So a few things to think about. One, uh, you might want to, before you get into it, just do a reboot of your computer just to <laughs> clean out everything, get all the junk out, and then Actually, just start up, open RAS, run it from your local drive. Don't try to do this over a network drive or on a shared drive. That's just asking for trouble. So do it on your local drive and make sure you've got enough hard drive space too, because it does crank out a lot of gigabytes when you're doing this. So just be aware of that. Um, it's new, so it has some quirkiness to it, but it's super cool, as you could just see from what Ben showed. Yep. Nice yeah. Job. And, and I'm sure, you know, like anything HEC releases in future versions that'll continue to be improved and, and refined. Um, so yeah, just be patient with it. But if you take some time, you can really create some cool output from it. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. Uh, I can see us using that more and more with even just regular project work. Just like you said, it's it's great for demonstrating to the client because people who aren't hydraulic modelers don't necessarily understand how to interpret even just a regular velocity map. Um, certainly profile lines and cross-section plots are a little bit hard for them to understand exactly what's going on sometimes. But when you can show the view as if you were a drone flying over um, a dam failure like that. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's really powerful, powerful yeah. way to to communicate what's potentially could happen in a dam failure. So oh, I just want to provide some clarification information here because I've, I've looked up um, some of the details about the breach wave. So it was seven to nine minutes before the breach wave hit the first town, but that wasn't okay. Johnstown. That was South Fork. Um, ah, okay. it, it took 57 minutes for the breach wave to reach Johnstown. So that distance probably is a little bit longer than I think. The flood wave was traveling roughly 40 miles per hour. Yeah, and this is all estimated based on modern dam breach analysis. So somebody else has probably developed a dam breach model similar to this one. Um, and they estimate that the flood wave reached 60 feet in some places. So Phew. significant, significant event. And so they did have an hour um, to potentially alert the town. But again, in that day and age, it was tough to travel that far in an hour. So, yeah, there's a lot of really interesting history, too, about that that dam and, and the actual event that um, if this interests you at all, I would highly encourage you to get on and do some research and reading about it. You'd probably just start with Wikipedia and go from there. But, um, yeah, it was, it was very interesting how that yeah. happened and what happened afterwards. Yeah, and there was... I, there was I, like yeah, so, like many yeah, instances where you have dam breach removal or 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 failure, there was so much sediment released um, that you know most of the town was covered in sediment. There were a number of bridges that had to be basically extracted with dynamite <laughs> um, in order to remove all the sediment and carnage around them. Um, so it was yeah a big pain from a cleanup standpoint, but obviously even more significant from a loss of life standpoint. Yeah. Yeah, I still have not gotten out there, but it's on my bucket list. Next time I'm in the area, I'm going to make a trip out to Johnstown and check out the memorial and, and just see what's what's going on out there. Uh, I have been out to Teton, though, Teton Dam and okay. what's left of that. And that's that's a pretty cool one. Um, if you're out in the area to go swing by and take a look, uh, you get a really nice overlook view of what's left of the dam and a little bit of history there, too. So but. Um, anyway, that was really good, Ben. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I always like doing stuff like that, you know, finding an interesting historical breach. And even though it's not necessarily a project, but um, you're able to put RAS to the test, see what it can do um, and get some pretty cool graphics out of it, too. Yep. Yeah. Obviously, nothing nothing was cooler than the Missoula flood one that you did, Chris. So we're all we're all playing for second. <laughs> oh man i got some more work to do on that one too so um stay tuned but um anyway cool well hey since we're talking about dam breach modeling why don't i do a little quick overview about how you go about setting up a HECRAS dam breach model uh, for those of you who might be new to it or thinking about doing it um let me get this this powerpoint started real quick
quick and then I'll demo in the software itself. But um, I tell you, even even with three screens, Ben, I still have trouble managing all this when I'm doing um, presentations. <laughs> yeah, it can be. It can I think be I need four screens. <laughs> Although, you know, to give you to give you a little bit of credit, I'm sure having done this over the last year, you're you're much better at it now than you would have been a year ago. So. Much more comfortable with it. Yes, that's for sure. But still run into trouble here and there. So what we're looking at here is what I would call the scope of a HECRAS dam breach model. You start with the hydrology, if you have any. If you're doing a flood loaded breach, for example, say a PMF coming in, you need to know what the hydrology is. You need to do a little bit of work up front. That's not done in the RAS model. Now, Ben showed an example of rain on grid. And so that, in a sense, is a way to add some hydrology to your RAS model uh, directly without um, computing it external. But if you're talking about a PMF flood and you want to route it through your watershed and have a really good hydrograph coming into your reservoir, you would do that external to RAS, maybe with HMS or something else. And so that's the first part. That's the upstream end. And then you've got your reservoir. And this is um, a large volume of water that we're going to effectively drain during the simulation in HEC RAS. In RAS, you can model your reservoir either as a storage area, as a one-dimensional reach, or as a two-dimensional area. Yeah, all three of those are available to model a reservoir, and they all have pluses and minuses to them. I'll talk about that in just a second. Then we have the dam itself, and uh, this could be an inline structure if this is an entirely one-dimensional model. It could be um, a SA2D area connection if it's a 2D model. Either way, you could put a breach in it. And with that breach, you would prescribe some breach parameters. Okay, and these are up to you to determine. Although the software is now evolving to a point where it can actually compute these breach parameters for you on the fly based on the loading, the hydraulic loading on the dam, as well as some of the makeup of the dam itself. And I'll show you some examples of that in just a second. And then finally, we have the downstream routing reach. And so this is where all the most of the action occurs, where you have inundation, you have damage, you have consequence and life loss. And so this is a very important piece of it. But this is also the hardest part of your model to stabilize because this is where you have all of the sudden change in velocity, all the extreme acceleration as flow is moving through the reach, as well as uh, a lot of times this downstream reach is either very shallow water or could be completely dry. If you've got an ephemeral stream and this is a storage reservoir, it may be completely dry. And if you're trying to do that in 1D, it can be really tricky. 2D is a lot easier for shallow or dry conditions to model because it uses that finite volume solution scheme. So this is kind of a generic scope or setup of your model. Now, the next question you want to ask yourself before you actually build your model is, do, you, do I want to make the reservoir a storage area? Do I want to make it out of a 1D reach with cross sections? Or do I want to make it a big 2D area? All three of those are available in HECRAS, but as I mentioned, they have their pluses and minuses. A storage area is simply just a level pool that goes up and down. There's no hydraulic gradient established in that storage area. There's no communication of velocity. There's no travel time communication through that storage area because it is just a level pool. But the advantage is it's very simple to use. It's simple to add into your model. All it requires is a stage storage curve and off you go. You connect it up with your, your 1D reach going downstream from that, and you've got yourself a dam breach model. So the way it works is you've got a queue coming in, a discharge coming in at a given time step. RAS will look at that stage storage curve that goes with the storage area, and using that queue, it picks up it um, it picks up a new, or sorry, measuring the amount of Q comes in, uh, coming in, gives you a new volume. So it goes to the volume curve, figures out what that new volume is, gets the stage that goes with that volume. Then it looks at the downstream control, whatever that is. In this case, it's going to be your dam. It could be gates at the dam. It could be the weir uh, or the spillway with the weir equation, or it could be a combination. But it looks at that and figures out what the stage discharge relationship or the rating curve is there. And so knowing the new stage, it can now pick off the outflow queue. 
So you've got an inflow that translates to a new volume that translates to a new stage, which translates to a new queue out. And this is all done in one time step. There's no, in a storage area, no travel time through here. Yep, that was a good explanation there, Chris. Yeah, thanks. And then let's say you want to do uh, your reservoir with cross sections. You want to build it with cross sections. Why would you want to do that? Well, what cross sections can do for you is it can set up a hydraulic gradient. And this could be very pronounced, especially in a dam breach model. In a typical reservoir routing model where we're not breaching the dam, but we're just routing flows through a reservoir, level pool uh, will work in more cases than it would in a dam breach model. Because with a dam breach, you have a sudden opening in the dam and a quick release of water. And that sets up a significant hydraulic gradient and a negative wave that moves upstream, which would not be captured with a storage area. So you'd want to model it with one dimensional cross sections or a 2D area. Now a 1D reach like you see here is going to show that gradient in the direction of flow along the axis of the reservoir. So you get a gradient in this direction, but because cross sections only get one water surface per cross section per time step, you don't have any gradient laterally. Okay, so that's the limitation of 1D is you only have the gradient in the direction of flow through the reservoir. But in this case, what it does is it actually runs your conservation of mass and conservation of momentum equations, and it determines Q, your Q and your H, your discharge and your stage at each one of these as it progresses through the reservoirs, it's routing through the reservoir, okay? Now for a 2D area, the reason you might switch to a 2D area is because you've got considerable lateral velocity components, okay? It's not just a gradient in the downstream direction, but you have gradients going laterally as well. And those can be picked up with a 2D area. Now the 1D, reach and the 2D area um, are pretty both fairly easy to set up provided you have terrain or bathymetry more specifically. So you need to have bathymetry in the reservoir or what's the, the topography below the water surface in order to cut these cross sections or to extract onto this two-dimensional area. Without that, you are either stuck with the storage area method because all it requires is the elevation volume curve, or you're gonna have to synthesize your own bathymetric surface. And there's ways to do that, but you're never gonna be perfect with it. So that's one reason why you might switch to a storage area if it's appropriate to use a storage area. It's not always appropriate. But as far as setting up, it's pretty easy. You just draw your cross sections covering the reservoir like you see right here. Now, if you have a, a pretty um, um, complicated looking reservoir, a lot of fingers coming into it, then you have to get a little bit tricky with how you set up junctions. And that might actually bump you into doing a 2D area because with the 2D area, all you do is you simply draw your 2D area around the reservoir. You add a DX and a DY for your cell spacing and you've got it right there. So it's this is a lot easier to set up than cross sections in my opinion but it's also more computationally intensive as well. So they all have pluses and minuses. Now, when you're talking about developing your breach, um, I usually start with rules of thumb to kind of get me in the ballpark uh, as far as what's the breach width, what's the side slopes of the breach, how long does it take to form, things like that. That can all be determined uh, at an initial level with these rules of thumb. Here you see, um, three different agencies, and actually the Corps of Engineers, which is this USACE one, has two different methods from two different years. But you've got the Corps, you've got the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and the National Weather Service. And they all sort of are relatively similar, um, slightly different, but you can see you've got your breach width, you've got your side slopes, and you've got your time to failure or your failure time. Actually, this could probably better be described as your breach development time. Is it fair to say too, Chris, that given the fact that the Corps of Engineers came out with new guidance in 2007, that they wouldn't advise using the old guidance from 1980? Honestly, I don't know. I don't know the difference and I don't know okay. what prompted this update and whether this is <laughs> thought of as better. Um, I would make the same assumption, Ben. Um, yeah, it, it looks more conservative. Probably. I mean, the 
the yeah. average breach width is larger, the failure time is lower. So it that's right. More conservative. <laughs> yeah, my guess is maybe there's been some more research done since 1980, and they figured out, oh, you know what? Earth dams can actually fail faster than a half an hour. Now, a lot of that depends on the size of the earth dam, how high it is, and what kind of material it's made up of. But yeah, I, I bet you're right there. But you can look at earth dams, concrete gravity dams, concrete arch dams. These are all going to fail differently because they're constructed differently and they have different strength properties. The arch dam is interesting because once you lose the integrity of that arch you, you develop a little bit of a crack in it it loses all of its strength because the con concrete arch dam is held in place not by its weight but by the arch itself so the arch translates all the force of the water behind it out to the abutment walls and once you lose that arch the whole thing comes down and that's why you see the average breach width is the entire dam or almost the entire dam and the side slopes match the valley wall slopes and look at this the failure time is extremely fast mm -hmm. less than six minutes um because hey once you once you lose <laughs> the strength integrity that thing's coming down and yeah maybe maybe you've seen that uh that um old superman movie right with uh christopher reeves you ever see that ben yeah, the, you're, that's that's your age. You're aging yourself. Oh my gosh, I can't believe you haven't seen that. You got to watch that movie because they have one of the the best dam breaches ever, and it, it was of Hoover Dam, which is an arch dam, um, and you can you can see the whole thing crumble really quickly. Now, <laughs> I'll just warn you, Ben, when you watch the flood wave move downstream in that movie, it is pretty hokey and uh, <laughs> certainly doesn't have the uh, um the cgi effects we have of today's movies but it's still kind of fun to watch anyway as so a damn breach modeler it wasn't <laughs> as accurate as what we can produce with RAS <laughs> rasmap in the 3d viewer now you would do better yeah we, we would do better with the 3d viewer <laughs> with uh an aerial image behind it than what you see in that movie it it, it was basically it was a s miniature model that they built and then they slowed it down to try and make it look like a full-scale event and you yeah. can actually see, <laughs> you can see these little miniature cars. <laughs> oh, anyway, it's, yeah, it's pretty hokey, but um, it, it does give you a pretty decent idea of what would happen if, you know, an arch dam were to fail. But anyway, I highly recommend you take a look at that movie, Ben. I can't believe that. That is one of the great movies of all time, too, by the way. <laughs> um, I think this is, I think this is turning into maybe a, a, a <laughs> free movie discussion before our next podcast we'll have to do that yeah the next one we'll have to uh co come with some movies you know maybe some water related movies there's some yeah, other ones with damn failures could, we, you know we could do we could do like a top five movies that have <laughs> damn failures in them or f flooding events or something so yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> all right so this is where i start start with the, the the rules of thumb and this like i said gets you kind of in the zone in the ballpark and, and lets you know where about where you should be you can notice that, that a lot of these are just ranges right but beyond that then oops i'm having trouble with my slides here let me just advance one beyond that you're going to have to figure out breach parameters using regression equations um, and those apply to earth embankment dams. Concrete dams, unfortunately, you're stuck with these kinds of tables, the rules of thumb, and common sense. But if you're talking about an earth fill or rock fill dam, you can use regression equations. And I want to introduce this TD39 document right here. So if you're going to do dam breach modeling, especially in HECRAS, get this document. It's TD39 using HECRAS for dam break studies. You can get it right off of the HEC website. Just search for that, or you can go, just Google TD-39, it's gonna come up. Um, but in here, you've got not only that table I showed you with the rules of thumb, uh, see how quickly I could scan down to it. Uh, it tells you everything about the process. There's the table I was just showing you, yep. but it also has regression equations in here, like you see right here, okay? And so these regression equations, in this case, we've got breach width here, We've got uh, failure time as well. And you can see several different methods are in here and they all have different ways of computing it. Now, there's some that are used more than others. The Froelich is very popular. He's got two methods, 1987 and 95. Uh, similar to that discussion we just had, Ben, I would probably gravitate to the 95 stuff more. But you've got uh, McDonald 
and language monopolists. That's another common one that I see people, Vontune, Vontune and Gillette is another one. Um, so these are all um, equations that you can use to narrow down on your breach widths and formation times and side slopes. So definitely recommend you look into that. And they have descriptions of each of those down below. So here you can see Frolic and so forth. So what that's gonna do for you is it's going to allow you to fill out this table right here. Under the unsteady flow analysis window, options, dam and levy breach. And here you can see we've got our breach parameters on the side, breach width, side slopes, and formation time you can get from those regression equations. The others, you have to use some common sense, maybe an understanding of what, what's out there on the site, like the final bottom elevation. Usually you set that to the foundation of your dam. Okay, so that's a good way to fill out this table. But again, some of this stuff you're going to have to use some common sense on. So let's go through these breach parameters. This center station just defines where the center of the breach is. You can see the breach outline in red. The dam, the normal dam is in gray. Once you run this model, you'll actually see in the cross-section viewer, you can see this breach grow to its final shape, which is the red line. Then you got the bottom width down here. Be careful because a lot of these regression equations, they'll compute the average breach width. So when you get that, you have to convert that to the bottom width using the side slopes and the height of the dam. A little geometry. And then um, you got your bottom elevation down here. You got your side slopes left and right. And the breach weir coefficient, that obviously doesn't show on the graphic, but this is the C value that's used in the weir equation just for the breach itself, not for the rest of the dam, but for the breach opening itself. That's the weir coefficient. Um, 2.6, I think, might be the default value. Uh, you can make a case it's probably not going to be a very smooth and efficient shape going through there. So your breach weir coefficient is probably going to be a little bit lower than a, a standard coefficient yeah. you'd use for a constructed weir. That would be an important one to do, sensitivity. Yes. Oh, well, in all of these, as a matter of fact, you yeah. would want to do sensitivity on. Yeah. But yeah, breach coefficient especially because there's there's so much uncertainty there. Um, and a breach formation time, how long does it take? for it to go from no breach to grow into this final shape. That's the 3.2 hours there. Okay, now you have, a, you have an option here. You can either do a piping failure or an overtopping failure. A piping failure is this, as if you get some internal erosion somewhere down below the crest. Usually it starts down lower and that erosion starts to bring material out from the dam and opens this this hole this orifice through the dam that's called a a pipe which is why it's called a piping failure and that pipe will grow and grow and grow until eventually it gets big enough that the top collapses down and you've got a fully opened breach so that's the piping failure mode overtopping starts at the top it's like if you get uh, a hydraulic or a hydrologic flood event coming in, say a PMF, and that raises the reservoir faster than you can drain it through your spill, your emergency spillway or, or other outlet means, and it starts to overtop and then erodes from the top down. Now, if you select piping, you have to provide a piping coefficient because RAS uses the orifice equation to simulate flows through the pipe until it fully forms the breach and at which point it will switch to the weir equation. Then you have to tell it where to start the uh, the pipe. At the very bottom, do you start near the top, somewhere in the middle? Nobody really knows. There's a lot of uncertainty with that. So definitely do sensitivity on where this pipe occurs. And then um, finally, you have to tell RAS when to start breaching it. What's the trigger? What initiates the breach? Here we see we have initiated it based on a water surface, meaning as the water rises, once it gets to 676.8, that's when the breach starts to form. So it starts this 3.2 hour clock and it will form the breach over 3.2 hours. Another way to do it is by water surface elevation plus duration. So once you get up to this elevation, it's going to run its own clock and 
once you exceed the duration, which would be another input for that, then it starts to fail. So this kind of communicates that, hey, I think my dam can take a certain amount of overtopping before it finally starts to erode. And that's that's usually the case. So I like using that water surface plus duration. And then the third method is just by time. Basically, you say, hey, at this time in the simulation, this is when I want you to start the breach. And that's going to be more used for sunny day failures where you've got no hydrologic loading. The water is just at, at a normal reservoir pool elevation and you're just going to breach it. And so you just provide a time somewhere in your simulation to have it go. All right. So now you've got your breach parameters in. Take a look at this breach progression. You have two automatic entries, linear and sine wave. Right here you see the sine wave. And this this actually tells RAS at what rate to grow. So we have the time it forms, but this tells the rate. And so here you can see it starts off growing slowly and then it speeds up its growth here and then it slows down again. And that's the sine wave curve. Linear is just a simple linear line across here. Uh, nobody knows what your dam will, will follow when it fails. So I always suggest people try both of these, although the sine wave does kind of make sense to me. It seems but, like the sine wave would maybe be more tied to like an earthen embankment failure where you're going to have piping or overtopping failure as opposed to a concrete dam failure where it's just going to go, you know. Yeah, maybe, yeah. That, maybe that's not maybe that's not reasonable. I don't know. No, that's a, that's a really good point. And that makes a lot of sense too. Um, mm -hmm. those those faster breaches probably are more linear. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, nobody knows. So try them both and and see which one gives you the the highest discharge for conservativeness or this is a plug for probabilistic dam breach modeling, which is another discussion we can have, but you can work this into a probabilistic dam breach approach. And I give tons of presentations on that. So if you're interested in that, um, just Google it and you'll see stuff. All right, so I'm gonna quickly go through these other tabs. I don't wanna get into too much detail, but if you'd like to have RAS compute the breach for you, rather than using these breach parameters, you can go over here and you can select from two options, the simplified physical, which is right here, and you're just providing a velocity and downcutting rate relationship. This is another thing. You don't know what this will be. I mean, there is some guidance on it, but nobody really knows what your dam's velocity downcutting rate relationship will be um, until it actually fails. So you just kind of have to take your best guess there. This is why I don't like using this too much. But it is there. People use it for levees more than dams, in, in my experience. The next one is this physical breaching DL breach. This is brand new to version six. Mm -hmm. And this actually will compute your breach based on the makeup of your dam. And so you put in things like your embankment width and, and slopes and, and then even some soil parameters and what erosion model you want to use. You can even put a cover layer on top of your dam and have a different description of that. So this is pretty slick. I've not had a chance to use it yet, so I can't demonstrate it. Um, but you can Google DL Breach and read more about it. Um, DL Breach is actually developed by um, Weiming Wu from the, from Clarkson University. And so just Google it. You'll find this information here if you want to learn more about it. So does, it does it just take your input parameters and select which equation to use to calculate based on your input parameters? Or is it a single equation that can take all this information to estimate a, a, a dam breach size? Yeah, he's he's got his own equations that he's developed. Wow. Okay. And, cool. and I have not. So this is all theoretically based. Yeah, uh, I don't know what went into developing this because I've not read up on his stuff yet, but I want to do that. But if I know if it's like uh, the stuff that the Agricultural Research Service has done, ARS and their um, wind dam model. Or or National Weather Service breach, HR breach, um, HR Wallingford is the company that put that out. Um, they all kind of have a mix of theory and some um, some actual real world prototype measurements that they've kind of worked into their into their equations and their methods. But I don't know what's inside this black box. So um, give it a read if you want to know more about it and um, see how it goes. Um, then we've got if we go back to the user entered data, you've got the ability to calculate those regression equations right here in RAS. And it'll save you a little bit of time of setting up a spreadsheet and doing it yourself. 
And so you can see the ones we have here, McDonald, Froelich, Fontoon, Xunjiang. Uh, it just requires some input data here. And then finally, we've got breach repair that nobody uses. <laughs> um, actually, <laughs> it's there. I think it was put in when they were trying to do some model simulations of um, Hurricane Katrina down in New Orleans when all those levees were breaching and they were trying to actually repair them in the middle of the breach event by dropping these giant sandbags in. So I think that's why that got put in there so they could simulate that event. But in reality, nobody's going out trying to repair a dam in the middle of it failing. Um, oh, so. that's not, well, I have an example, Chris. So uh, on the Spokane River, um, I don't remember when this was. Uh, it had to be at least 30 years ago. There was a, a breach of one of the dams uh, on the upper Spokane River. And the failure, it, it started to fail, and they were worried about the whole dam cascading. And so the story goes, at least this is from a dam operator who we talked to when I was in school in Spokane. And he said that they basically called up every contractor in the greater Spokane area who had a dump truck and had every one of them loaded up, come come out, and they drove out on the on the dam crest, dumped their dump truck load, and they apparently filled the gap and it didn't it didn't fail. So uh, again, that may be a little bit of a folklore legend, but the guy he was a dam breach op or a dam operator for a number of years, so um, there's probably some truth to that. So this would be a good example of of when to use that. Wow, yeah, I've not heard that story. I hope I hope those dump truck drivers got um, danger pay for that. <laughs> Can you imagine <laughs> yeah, it's, how it's much coaxing it would take to, 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 to have them drive across that dam crest as it's failing? Yeah. Um, wow, yeah, that's crazy. Uh, but yeah, so I suppose if you do have a situation like that, you you can make use of this. But, um, you know, I, I've never used it for an actual project before, but. I've played around with it for fun. We used to do it in a, a workshop that I would give for dam breach modeling. Um, but anyway, that's that. Um, just really quick, a um, couple things to think about. Um, when you're doing a dam breach modeling, all of the action is going to be downstream of the dam. It's going to be very unstable potentially. So think about adding more base flow in there to help uh, stabilizing your to help stabilize your model. Add higher end values. You're going to have a lot more turbulence, so you can justify it. And higher end values give you higher stage, which gives you more stability. And then the other thing I want to mention, too, is definitely turn on mixed flow, especially if it's a small stream downstream of the dam, because mixed flow is going to help smooth out instabilities at the front of the flood wave where you've got this uh, near critical or even super critical flow that tends to happen there. So, so definitely look into those features. And and like mm -hmm. like anything, if you're increasing mainings values, adding base flow, turning on mixed flow, that those are all good things to do to get the model stable. But then yeah. try to back off some of those and bring them back into, uh, I guess, a more, a more accepted or normal range for mainings, uh, the known base flow for flow, yada, yada. Um, you know, you always want to stabilize your model and then slowly kind of try to bring those parameters back to a defensible position. And then if you're having issues with instability, you can, there might be something underlying that's causing that issue. Yeah, that's that's the key word there, Ben, defensible. I'm glad you brought that up because anytime you are putting in a parameter into RAS, you have to be, be ready to defend that to whoever's reviewing it. And if you're using N values in your routing reach of, you know, 0.5, you're going to have a hard time defending that value even if it is a dam breach model uh, 0.05 now okay that's more defendable um probably you could use something higher even than that up in the 0.1 range maybe right below the the dam itself during the breach but yeah you have to defend everything and then finally i want to leave everybody with this uh finite volume solution scheme for 1d if you're doing your dam breach model in 1d and you're having lots of stability issues because you've got really shallow depths and then a big flood wave dumping onto that this finite volume solution scheme has some potential to take care of that problem so take a look at that read up about it um, basically one of the big benefits of finite volume is you can go completely dry in your 1d reach now with that solution scheme if you opt to use it but even if you're not going dry, it gives you much more stability at low stages, especially when you've got a big hydrograph coming in on top of that. So, awesome. Yeah. Well, All thanks, right. Chris. That was a that was a great little summary of kind of how to start dam breach analysis. Um, 
again, there's a lot more information um, that we could could talk about when it comes to dam breach analysis. There's a lot of nuance. Again, if you can model a dam breach analysis, uh, a dam breach event, you can model just about anything because of how dynamic the event is. So That's right. um, it's, yeah. a, it's a great thing to, to learn how to do. Um, and if you're interested in learning how to do it, uh, Chris and I have our next online 1D2D modeling HEC RAS class uh, using the new 6.0 version coming up next week. We're starting on yeah. May 12th, Wednesday, May 12th. Um, the class is going to run for six weeks. So I believe that brings us to June 20, June 30th, I think is the last session. Um, and it's uh, basically the format of the class is one four hour lecture every Wednesday from eight to noon Pacific time. It's 8 a.m. to noon Pacific time. Um, and then in between the lecture sessions, we have workshops that all of uh, you guys can can do. Um, take basically what you've learned in the lectures, apply them to actually using the model in software, and then we get back together. We we review that workshop. We answer questions about it. It's a really, really great way to learn. We've had some great reviews. Um, typically, Chris and I had always taught this class in person over just a three day period, so it was more concentrated. But people seem to really, really enjoy the spaced out class because not only does it allow them to really have time to really dive into the workshops and explore some of the new 6.0 features, but um, they seem to just pick up things better and remember things better after the class is finished. So uh, if you are interested in learning more about 1D, 2D uh, modeling in HEC RAS, I uh, would really encourage you guys to sign up for this class. Um, if you need more information, you can email HEC RAS at Um We'd love to get uh, many, many people signed up for the class. Anything else on that, Chris? No, that was that was good, Ben. Good uh, summary of that. And there's there's still time to sign up, but it is filling up, so don't wait too long. And uh, we hope to see you there. It's we have a lot of fun. I mean, it's it's almost kind of like this podcast in a way. Um, it's very casual. We talk about food. We talk about uh, sports, and <laughs> but more importantly, we talk about HECRAS too. And we get you guys up and running for uh, 1D, 2D HECRAS modeling. So come join us. It'll be fun. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks everybody again uh, for joining us on this episode of Full Momentum. Uh, we really focused in on dam breach analysis, both a historic event associated with the dam breach, as well as kind of how to get started. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, this has been Full Momentum and HEC RAS podcast. Thanks, everybody.